The NBA is on the cusp of signing league-altering media deals. Plus, new legislation that just went into effect and federal action could change the ticket-buying experience across sports and may even bring down prices. And the U.S. men's national soccer team finally fired their coach. It's Friday, July 12th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The U.S. men's national soccer team finally did what many had been calling on them to do for months, if not more, by firing head coach Greg Berhalter. The U.S. Soccer Federation had stuck by the coach to this point, renewing his contract in 2022, but the final straw was the team failing to advance out of the group stage in Copa America. This was the national team's big chance to say that we can compete with the Brazils and Argentinas of the world, and we're ready to make some noise in the 2026 World Cup. Instead, the U.S. was ousted by Panama, which has a population that is 2% of the U.S. and has only qualified for the World Cup once in its entire history. That happened to be in 2018, when they took a spot that would have otherwise gone to the U.S. The U.S. failing to even qualify for the World Cup that year led to the hiring of Berhalter. Now, whoever steps into Berhalter's shoes will inherit a team that is desperate to show that they can make an impact on the international stage because the 2026 World Cup is anticipated to be the biggest sporting event of all time, and it would be a massive disappointment if years of anticipation led to another group stage exit. You, yes you, can own a piece of a baseball team, not a major league team, but one that has already seen several players join MLB organizations in its short existence. I'm referring to the Oakland Ballers, the independent league team that began playing this year. The team is currently sounding its fan base to see what level of financial support fans will be willing to commit with plans to open up some sort of share purchasing process in the near future. The Ballers were inspired by the Oakland Roots, the city's USL soccer team, which raised close to $2 million by selling off ownership shares for as little as $100. The Ballers are looking to take that model even further by offering voting shares to fans, allowing them to influence how the team is run. That's both a novel concept in American sports and a stark contrast to the other Oakland baseball team. A's fans feel that they are losing their baseball team because of the decisions and failures of one person, owner John Fisher, who has separated himself from the team's community in every way possible. The Ballers are rooting their community relationship into their ownership structure. NBA media rights are on the finish line. Joining me now to discuss is front office sports tuned in columnist Mike McCarthy. Welcome, Mike. Great to be here, Owen. Great to have you. I feel like we've been anticipating this day for months, probably years. Um, It's not quite a done deal yet, but the reporting is basically what we expected. 76 billion over 11 years. Uh, NBC, Amazon, ESPN. Um, We'll talk about TNT and they could still get in there, but your top line reaction to, to this deal. Well, I hate to break it to everybody who saw the headlines yesterday and thought there was some definitive end to the soap opera. But we still have uh, a couple of plays to play here, Owen. It's end game time. Mm-hmm. Uh, what happened uh, this week is uh, the NBA finally got the paperwork, the actual contractual offers from ESPN, from Prime, and from NBC. Now, for the end game, we have to see if TNT will match those offers. And if the NBA rejects their counteroffer, if the TNT will then sue the NBA the way Rune Arledge and ABC Sports did 50 years ago. So it's one of those things in sports media where, again, we're looking at a situation where will history repeat itself? Yeah, very interesting. And for, just because they're, NBC is the one that is seen as replacing TNT here uh, because they're the new player, it's always been in my brain that that's who TNT is matching. Is that accurate or can they just match it? any part of this it's actually not accurate i mean technically uh since they're one of the third party bidders it could be but i'm hearing uh from my sources and i've seen this reported many other places that in fact tnt's plan is to try to match amazon prime's offer interesting uh, since amazon prime is purely a streaming partner and they have the max streaming platform problem is you can't really compete with amazon prime they've got 200 million plus subscribers And Max, which is doing very well, is still under 100 million. So Silver could use that discrepancy and say, well, you know what I mean? Amazon Prime versus Max. eh, I'm going with Amazon Prime. Right. So if they matched, would they be matching just as a streaming broadcaster or could they still put games on TNT? 
uh, they could still, uh, you know, put games uh, on TNT. I mean, it, you know, it's all to be worked out. But here's the thing about this so-called matching rights, Owens. What is a match? You know, right. is it TNT giving the same exact money as the third-party bidder? Or is it a, a, an equality in platforms and broadcast reach and all this type of stuff? For example, NBC is a broadcast network. TNT can't compete with that because WBD doesn't own a broadcast network. So, I mean, as uh, Andrew Brandt, who's about as smart about sports law as anybody ever met, said, there will be lawyers. So there's the TNT piece of this that's that's still, you know, waiting to to be decided here. What are you watching for in terms of, like, next domino to fall? Well, it's really a question for David Zaslav. I mean, this is one of the most unpredictable executives we've ever seen. And the question is, does he want to fight? Does he want to go to the mat and actually sue a league partner? I mean, it's really not uh, done. It, uh, it hasn't been done in 50 years, as far as I can tell, going back to Rune Orledge. Um, But Rune Orledge did do it in 1973 when he felt he was screwed by the NBA. And he took it out on the NBA, and he especially took it out on CBS by counter-programming all their NBA games. So, I mean, it's really up to uh, Z David Zaslav. The ball is firmly in his court. Right. And I mean, this this has been a whole saga at WBD for this because they could have gotten the NBA at a cheaper price. At least that was my understanding. Who knows if every report is accurate, but yeah. um, it, it sounds like he kind of balked at the, you know, where things were initially. And now, now they're more expensive. You know, I've read that report a lot of times and, uh, you know, I'm not here to tell you that I think it's completely false. I'm going to tell you what my sources have told me, mm -hmm. which is, that is not quite true. That for TNT and WBD, the NBA was a moving target. Yeah. Uh, that they went to them and said, hey, we'll offer you this. And, you know, that was the offer that T, uh, NBA was looking for. And then N NBA came back to them and said, well, now we want this. So the the goalposts kept shifting during negotiations for what I'm uh, hearing. Look, yeah. we, we all talk to different people. We all are getting spun certain ways. This whole thing is a soap opera. But uh, I don't think it's quite true that this uh, idea that WBD tried to lowball the NBA. I, I think they did want to stay in the NBA business. They didn't want to overpay for it. I think what happened is they miscalculated the eagerness of an NBA, of, of an NBC rather, yeah. and a prime to come in and just blow their offer out of the water. That's the big mistake they made. And where's W, assuming they're out, which I know is not a safe assumption right now, but where are we putting WBD just in the sports media landscape? I mean, they've been getting out of the RSN game. They looks like yeah. they could well be out of the NBA. Should we still be thinking of them as, as a major sports broadcaster? Oh, yeah. They, they will still be a major player. Uh, you know, they have Major League Baseball. They have the NHL. They have half of March Madness. You saw in the last couple of months, they've been picking up rights left and right. right. They got a little piece of uh, the NCAA uh, college football playoff. They got the French Open. They're picking up the Mountain West. They're picking up the Big East. Now, uh, TNT would tell you, well, this has got nothing to do with the NBA. You know what I mean? We're just doing this because this is our normal course of business. But you could also make the argument, Owen, and I might, that they're backing themselves up a little bit here. Sure. That if they yeah. lose – the NBA, they are starting to fill the slots in their schedule with new sports programming. So trust me, they're uh, they're going to be around a long time. They're going to be a major player. But, you know, there's no, uh, you know, uh, sugarcoating it for Zaslav and WBD. You know, uh, losing the NBA would be a major loss. And if they do, he will go down as the executive who, quote unquote, lost the NBA. Yeah. And let's talk about the NBA for a second here. Um, where does this put them in the the stratosphere of, you know, just like sports properties and how valuable they are? Yeah, well, you know, give it up to Adam Silver here. I mean, he went into these negotiations, Owen, at a time when the economy was down and sports rights were tightening, and he tripled their rights. Yeah, they're going from twenty four billion dollars to seventy six billion dollars uh, long term, which is astounding for him to triple the rights in this market. So, uh, you know, the, the NBA owners should be very pleased with Silver. You know, these rights deal put them right behind uh, the NFL as the second most valuable property rights wise uh, in this country. And uh, I think Adam's going to get a big old raise out of this. Yeah. I mean, if, <laughs> if anything would do it, you'd think this would. Yeah. Um, 
the NFL, since we, we bring them them up, you know, they signed these massive deals. They're getting you know, like $10 billion plus dollars per year. And then they found lots of little ways to, to add on to that. You know, there's the 17th game. There's the Christmas game. There's probably an 18th game coming soon. Do you expect that little, you know, like those those extra add-ons to find their way somehow into the NBA? Uh, oh, and the, there's nobody better than the NFL at just conjuring new rights out of thin air. I mean, they slice the bologna so many different ways. Uh, I think uh, what the NBA has done during these rights negotiation has taken a page out of Roger Goodell's book, which is they've sliced it and diced it, and, you know, making all these little piecemeal uh, offers to, you know, increase the overall offer. You know, do you want the All-Star game? Do you want the play-in tournament? You know, do you want a first-round series? Do you want a conference final? All that type of stuff. Uh, so, you know, they've played, uh, you know, their hand very good. I mean, I think the story to watch here from the NFL standpoint is they're looking at the money that the NBA is getting, and they're saying to themselves, we have the opportunity to opt out of our 10-year deals in seven years. In hmm. other words, just reopen the market. Yeah, wow. Well. Whatever you agreed on five years ago, now you're going to have to double it. You're That's right. yeah. going to be the next big play. And when that happens, this business is going to go up in smoke. All right, we'll leave it there. Mike McCarthy, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. I'm joined now by Ted Merman, Executive Director of the UC Berkeley Center for Consumer Law and Economic Justice, and also the Director of the California Low Income Consumer Coalition. Welcome, Ted. It's good to be here. Thanks, John. Thanks so much for, for coming on. So let's start with the basics. New legislation in California kicked in this month that forces Ticketmaster and other ticketing companies to change how they display prices. What does this legislation do? Uh, very simply, it requires that uh, an advertised price contain all mandatory charges, mandatory fees. And that means you can't charge separately anymore for ticketing fees, service fees, convenience fees, per order fees, handling fees, payment processing fees, you name it, all of those extra fees that have been baffling us for the last few years uh, now have to be included within the price. They can, you know, the company, any company, ticket ticket company or otherwise, can still tell you, here's how we break down the total amount, but they got to give you the total amount right from the beginning. Yeah. And so um, why was this a big enough deal for, for you to devote your efforts to it and for the California legislature to give it their attention? Well, I got to give credit to Attorney General Rob Bonta, <laughs> who mm -hmm. was uh, our co-sponsor of the bill. Uh, and uh, frankly, to the Biden administration, they have been taking on this idea of uh, trying to do something about junk fees that consumers have been facing all across the economy. Uh, you can you, we've seen it in airlines uh, charging for uh, seat selection and 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 other things that you would think you know are mandatory. <laughs> mm -hmm, <laughs> you need a seat. Right. Uh, you need to you know or charging you for sitting together. Mm -hmm. um, to uh, two tickets, as you mentioned, to uh, the strange convenience fees and delivery fees that you get when you order something to it arrives at your home. So it really has been across the board. Someone presumably in some business school came up with the idea that, hey, if you charge consumers less up front and then add a little and add a little, they'll take a higher total amount than if you give them the full amount right up front. Uh, that so-called drip pricing uh, technique is building on consumer psychology. Uh, I think consumers ultimately decided enough was enough. The Biden administration uh, said something about this uh, last year uh, in the State of the Union. The president devoted 19 sentences in the State of the Union wow. to this sort of junk fee. And we've seen uh, it at work across the federal government. And uh, I think to California's honor, uh, it uh, saw its first full manifestation in Senate Bill 478, uh, passed last year, went into effect July 1st of this year, which simply says you've got to include all of those mandatory fees in the price that consumers see. And, you know, this is a California bill, but, uh, you know, California, I forget if it's the fifth or sixth largest economy that stat that's often quoted around here. Um, and these companies are national, in some cases, international is the sense that now that California is mandating this, 
this is just going to be the way of the world going forward? Or, or are they going to sort of have, you know, software carve outs essentially that where you see one price in California and uh, another price in, you know, Nevada and everywhere else? That's a good question. And we'll have to see. I'm interested to hear. Perhaps your audience can tell us mm -hmm. uh, what they're seeing in their own states. Uh, and frankly, your audience members in California, what they're seeing in California, if they've noticed a change, uh, this went into effect July 1st. Um, we have seen at least one other state pass a very similar bill. Minnesota passed a, a disclosure bill this past year as well. And frankly, the Federal Trade Commission, the, the, you know, the National Consumer Protection Agency, has a proposed rule that would uh, require this across the country if that rule is ultimately made final. Mm -hmm. And I, I've heard, you know, these junk fees, as they're called, described as not just annoying, but sort of anti-competitive and anti-consumer and, you know, a, you know, a suck on the, you know, consumer finances. Um, you know, what, what's the what's the case for why this is more than just a nuisance? Well, I'll answer that two ways. The first is just to say, because it's a way of charging people more money. It's, <laughs> uh, I think all of us in, in, in a time of inflation, especially recent inflation, uh, can say that we understand what it means to see the prices for things that we've grown used to for years suddenly uh, jump up. And this is a way of concealing or at least attempting to conceal the true cost of the products and services that we're buying. And so that's a hit on consumers everywhere. And it's a greater hit on consumers. And, you know, these are folks for whom it's much more than just a nuisance. The other side, I'll say, and you mentioned anti-competitive or antitrust, uh, there's a, just to take an example, uh, the United States Department of Justice recently brought a case against Ticketmaster Live Nation for uh, its uh, monopoly behavior in the uh, con primarily in the concert promotion, concert venue, concert ticketing realm. Uh, and one of the things that, that DOJ was most uh, certain to point out was that because of its control uh, over the venues and, and it's, it had the freedom uh, to charge whatever prices it wanted, but also to charge whatever fees it wanted. And uh, Attorney General Garland mentioned <laughs> specifically uh, about seven or eight types of fees that uh, Ticketmaster was able to charge that it wouldn't be able to charge in a market that was really competitive, where there were other uh, ticketing agencies and that presumably uh, these sorts of nonsense fees would be driven out. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's something I've been sort of curious to see. And obviously, we have to see this play out a little bit. But, you know, if all these ticketing companies have to put the price up front, that either means that you're just going to see a higher price or your or the price itself will be lower or, you know, probably somewhere in the middle because there's there's a lot of room in the middle. Um, but that at least if if the attorney general is correct there, some of the effect will be that, yeah, there will be maybe a more competitive market and just a um, and that games and everything else that people go to airline tickets might actually get cheaper because um, uh, uh, because people are, you know, maybe calibrated toward paying a certain price. And then when the price goes up $100, when they actually pay for it, they say, Oh, well, that's too bad. But I guess yeah, I've come this far. Um, but maybe, you know, those prices will go down because they will drop to what people are used to seeing. I think that's, a, yes, that's a very good point. Uh, and that's especially going to be true in a competitive market where there are other um, ticketing agencies or airlines <laughs> mm -hmm. or what have you uh, who can come in and say, you know, use our product. We don't, you know, here's, here's the final price that we're charging. Um, remember that a business in whatever market uh, that charges the full price and tells you what the full price is, has been disadvantaged over the last few years, mm. uh, facing competitors who were charging what seemed to be a lower price, but weren't. <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> in fact, by the time you got to the bottom line, it was at least as high, maybe higher. So this is very good for honest businesses. Uh, and one of the things, for example, you mentioned ticketing in particular, uh, if the DOJ lawsuit against Live Nation Ticketmaster does succeed, 
uh, then there is the possibility of other entrants into that market. And once you have a competitive market, I think it is fair to expect that the prices, the bottom line prices will go down. Yeah. I mean, the, I, I know the, the DOJ lawsuit is very much its own story, but in a way it feels like one big movement against the ticketing companies to, yeah, be more of a competitive market because as yes, there's the element of making it a fairer marketplace, which uh, this this bill um, around junk fees is doing. And then there's, yeah, just the element of, okay, you can have a fair marketplace, but if there's still only, you know, two or three players in that marketplace, uh, or, you know, one super dominant one in Ticketmaster, um, that's still going to have some kind of, you know, monopoly effects. But, you know, maybe there is, seems like in the last year, there's this trend toward, um, yeah, trying to create both the marketplace and the market for for people to shop around and say, okay, I can get you know twenty five dollars here, twenty dollars here, fifteen dollars there, um, and uh, and create you know something that that actually lowers prices to to what you would see in whatever a competitive marketplace would actually show. You know, it's a, it's a very good point that you make. The, what we've seen in the past few years, the Biden administration has been very active in this uh, field, but not alone. State attorneys general are also involved in bringing about a, an, a bringing to concrete form uh, a new and and revived theory of antitrust law of of the importance of competition in markets of really not just looking at well. Are thing are prices still cheap even though there's an incredibly dominant player in well in one market? But what about innovation? What about quality? Uh, what about the structure of the markets themselves? Uh, and that sort of attention is is uh, I won't say new in the sense that it's never been there before, but new since about 1980 when we switched uh, and pivoted in a very different direction. So what's happened in the past even five years? has been a real sea change. We will see if it lasts, but I think that from the point of view of consumers, from the point of view of the nation's economy overall, it's a very good thing. Yeah, I mean, I think we've just gotten used to these these mega merger, merger, mergers, sorry, gotten used to these mega mergers of, you know, telecom companies, the airlines, the, you, know, you could probably go on and on. There, you know, it seems like there used to be 10 companies and now there's five and then there's three. And because, um, you know, they all own each other. And, um, and yeah, that's just been, yeah. The, the state of America for the last 40 years for, for better or worse. Um, and, and so, yeah, it'll just be interesting to see, you know, <laughs> if what, what this new way is. And also it, it, I mean, so many things are kind of built to be that size, I guess. And we're seeing this with streaming companies too, of like a, a lot of them want to merge and the administration is saying, well, like, hold on, we don't want full on media consolidation at the same time. If you're, paramount and you're trying to compete with amazon and apple and google all of a sudden um you know it, it helps to kind of team up with you know peacock or whoever you can kind of get in on your side or like skydance now with paramount anyway it, it's um it, it's it, you know the federal government's taken this different approach in general to you know the, the marketplace and and yeah i mean this is sort of a way too general point but I guess we'll have to see both of this administration continues on, but also, um, yeah, the kinds of effects it's going to have because it is a pretty noted shift in just how the, the corporate sector has interacted with the federal government. I think that's true. Uh, and I think it's also true that we needed some more weight in the, this pan of the balance at the very least. Um, it's also uh, useful to keep in mind that this is a bipartisan effort among the 30 states in the district, of, including the District of Columbia, that joined uh, the Department of Justice in the Ticketmaster case uh, are such uh, notable liberal leaning states as Texas, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is very much uh, uh, a, a bipartisan uh, effort. I think it's a bipartisan concern. No one wants these ticket prices spinning out of control. No one wants uh, to have a a choice of one or two or, or, or no choice at all uh, in, in uh, players in any given market. And yes, there's economies of scale that are helpful. Uh, there is, as I mentioned, a balance to be struck. But for too long, really for half a century almost, we've seen the pendulum swing far, far in one direction. And it's good to see it coming back. 
so you know the, the victory is official on on this this part of things you know junk fees in california are no more um or they are up front now um is there a, a a next thing in this realm that that you're focused on now what a good question uh there is legislation pending i can't say that i've been directly involved in it uh to do with uh ticket reselling right mm -hmm. now uh, for example there's a bill that's still live that would uh as amended yesterday <laughs> mm -hmm. so this is very hot <laughs> yeah. mistake um uh would forbid companies from having their employees or contractors stand in line uh metaphorically or or in in real life uh to get tickets so that they can be uh gobbled up and then resold at a gigantic uh markup uh there's been a back and forth over uh, whether and how much freedom folks should have to resell tickets that they have procured. But the problem is one that people agree on, and that is that the average person is seeing, uh, is just having a very difficult time getting a ticket to a live performance of any kind, musical or sporting. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when they finally, if they finally do get a chance to buy a ticket, it's it somehow it's a multiple of right. the face value of the ticket and that's a problem yeah yeah it is a, a funny situation where you've got you know, for an event that is definitely going to sell out you know often the the price will stay below what you know a, a full-on bidding market would would allow for um you know let's say that the price for you know, let's say that the price for a concert a, a game is a hundred dollars but yeah, those get snapped up in the first, you know, 30 seconds of those tickets being available. And then, yeah, if you want to get in with your, your family of four or whatever, um, yeah, you're going to pay, you know, 200 $300 for the same thing. Often at front office sports here, the way we kind of gauge um, the demand for an event is not the ticket price itself, because that, you know, has, you know, a, a number of different factors go into that, including just the the venue the team the league might just set it at a certain price and say we don't want to we want certain tickets to be this cheap but on the secondary market you can see you know in some ways a greater sense of the demand for that event of you know yeah it took fifty dollars for the first person to get that ticket but now you got to pay 500 to um to actually get in that's a good that's a really good point uh and, and you know there's i suppose that this sort of this, this straight ahead economics question should we interfere yeah. <laughs> in yeah. such a in in the in this market uh and i think some there's something to be said really and this is a digital age we're we're living in it's very difficult for people to get uh shared experiences and to have in person uh experiences with lots of other people uh and that's something that uh is to be treasured and not to be reserved for just for the people who can pay thousands of dollars for each of these events. Uh, you know, I, I think that there's something to be said, for, a lot to be said for making this available uh, to a much greater segment of the population. Yeah. Very interesting stuff. Ted Merman, thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's great to be here. Thanks, Owen. That's it for today. Drop us a rating and review wherever you get your podcast and tell your friends about the show. Thanks for listening. We will see you on Monday.